Right, pray with me, loving Father, I would that you would empty me of self, even this very moment. I would that you would uh, show up in this place like you've never done before. God, I just want to thank you, and I want to glorify your holy name for being God. Just the fact that you are God, because I entered this year and I have no clue that I will be standing here today, but I am assured that you, you know, you knew that I was going to be here. Lord, I put my life into your hands this very moment. I put myself, my words, Lord, I ask that you will give me words to say to these people. And Lord, I pray that you will give them ears to listen, because none of what we do or say here will make sense if you are not the object of our worship. So please, Lord, as we open this word and as we should hear from you, change our hearts. Give us a new perspective on life. We pray in the matchless and holy name of Jesus. Let everyone in the church say, Amen. I want to let you know that as we look forward to 2017, I want to let you know that the season of that in the season of making New Year's resolution, if you plan to make a resolution list, or if you have already made your resolution list, you will fail. Can I say it again? If you plan to make a resolution list, or if you have already made your resolutions for the new year, for 2017, you will fail. In fact, only about 8% of all resolutions that are made are actually kept. Only about 8% of all resolutions. I'm telling you this week alone, I can tell you I've read maybe 4 or 5 or even more articles on New Year's resolution. How do you Keep your New Year's resolution. Should we change it from New Year's resolutions to New Year's intentions? Should we change them from uh, uh, resolutions to making good habits? And the list goes on. You will fail if you make New Year's resolution. But if you do these three things, if you consider these three things, you will Come out on the better side, on the winning side. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. I'm, I'm sorry, the book of Mark. And as we go through this message, I want you to know that I myself, me, right here, looking at you, probably have my New Year's resolution list since January 2nd of this year because it was the list for last year and I dropped off the first day so I put it down and said you know what I will make the list next year and so it was ready and it's ready and sitting there waiting for 2017 but you and I know that it takes more work <laughs> to pay attention to what's on that list than it is to do anything else. You see, when you make a New Year's resolution, you are actually motivated by you and only you, or maybe the folks around you who don't really care much about you. But yes, you make resolution to please them. That's some of the things that New Year's resolution bring to the table. But I want you to see if Jesus have a different perspective on how we should look at life. I want you to, to actually look if, if, there, if there was a place in the passage of Scripture that, that, that Jesus actually says to, 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 to his disciples or to anyone else, this is how you do life. 
Well, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, I, 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 I was reading through this book uh, throughout the year and we have been praying, uh, uh, um, we've been praying on Wednesday night with the book Step to Christ and the two, both the book of Matthew and, and Step to Christ led me to this conclusion. I like the book of, Matt, uh, uh, book of Mark and, 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 and the way how Mark put things is this. He, he, he started off the book, that started off the, the, the story or the account of Jesus by letting us see the bigger picture of God's glory. He shows us how powerful God is when it comes on to uh, uh, talking to a storm and, and having the sea quiet at his voice. He, he shows us that Jesus can actually just show up in the synagogue and the demons could identify that he is indeed the Son of God. He showed us in, in his encounter in the first eight chapter of the book of Mark, we see that Jesus is a powerful God that this is what he does. He healed the sick, he cast out demons, and even the winds and the wave obey his voice. He fed 5,000. Yes, he did it again and he fed another 4,000. He healed a blind man. All of this leading up to this point. Pick me up at verse 27 of Matthew chapter 8. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do, you, who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. All of these answers, my friends, do tell us one thing about what the people think. At least they have gotten the message thus far. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is powerful. You see, when a prophet comes, he's coming from God. So if they classify you as a prophet, you have some power that is outside of yourself. Is that clear, everybody? They recognize that the power that Jesus had was outside of himself. And that's why they referred to Elijah. And that's why they say maybe one of the prophets. Verse 29, he said to them. Now, this is the challenging part. He said to them, and I want you to pay close attention to this question. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And my best friend that I met in this book, Peter, answered him and said, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them and said, Tell no one about me. What's up with all this secret? Jesus but again this is another issue with Mark all of this is meant to be a secret all of this was said to be a secret covering the understanding of who the true Messiah was Jesus knew he was the Messiah but little on a little later on in this passage we will recognize that not everyone really understand what the Messiah is all about Let's look at verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after these three days, rise again notice what happened a couple verses earlier question asked who do you say that I, that I am Peter you are the Christ and now Jesus saying well the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days, rise again. I don't understand this, Jesus. It seems as if you acknowledge that you are the Messiah when you said, okay, tell no one. But yet you're telling us about the Messiah or the Son of Man 
suffering. What is this suffering all about, Jesus? It's complicated. He probably responded. He didn't say that. The Bible says he did this openly. I want to bring this to your attention. That before this account, Jesus speak to the different groups of people, different messages. There's a message for the Jews. There's a message for the Gentiles. But this message was given to a collective group, Jews and Gentiles alike. Everyone was represented there. You and I were represented right at that very moment. Then Peter took him aside and said, and rebuked him saying, and started to rebuke him and starting to tell him his heart's desire. I want you to go into Peter's shoes this very moment. To understand why Peter would rebuke Jesus. Why would he start rebuking Jesus after Jesus mentioned suffering? You see, Peter was there with Jesus when all of this wonderful things were happening. When all the miracles and all the healing was happening. And Peter was there and he thought that he had this all in the pocket. He thought he knew that one day soon he will be sitting beside Jesus, the new earthly king. I do want you to remember that some of us have experienced the power of God in your life throughout this past year thus far. I want you to reflect on the fact that Peter represented you in that you were there when you have some storms in your life and God came out and calm it for you. I want you to recognize that Jesus was there when you were lonely and have no one to talk to. Yes, he met some folks by the wayside. Yes, folks reached out to him and touched his garment. I want you to reflect on the fact that sometime this year you felt at some point that you had to reach out and touch Jesus' robe. Yes, it was there. Yes, you were there. I want you to know, Sister Diana, that this week while you were traveling and going down to Mishawaka, and I'm on the phone with her and I felt like I was there when she had a close call with what could have been death. I felt it right through the phone as her and her husband was down in Mishawaka taking care of some things and I was talking to her and I felt it. The car was right in our lane. After the gasp, that was the first words they said, thank you, Jesus. That has to be God. I wonder how many of us have moments like these throughout this past year. Maybe a lot of us. But I know that there are times that throughout this year you, you didn't hold on to those moments. You praise God. And if I ask five or six or maybe seven or eight or nine or ten of you, or maybe if I ask all of you, you'll say, I had my moment. And what I did in my moment was to raise in singing. I serve a risen Savior. He's in this world today. I know that He's leading. Whatever man may say, I can see His hands of mercy. I can hear His voice of cheer. And just the time you need him, he's always there. He lives. He lives. And that's what Peter had in the back of his mind. The God that I have been, the, the, the man or the friend that I've been walking side by side with, he's been here. And I know he's going to be around for a long time. And I, that's how you felt. This week in those comfortable positions. But look at this. This Peter who experienced so much power called Jesus to the side to rebuke him. 
My question to you, in spite of all those opportunities or those places where you glorified God, where you saw that God was working, where are those moments this year that you rebuked him? Or you called him to the side and said, I don't know if, I don't know if this is the right thing, Jesus. I, I'm not ready for this. Where, 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 can you reflect on those moments? I was there, my friends. There were times when I thought, that, no, 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 Jesus, you can't leave me hanging here like this. You had those moments. We all do. Let's continue to read. Jesus, after re uh, Peter was re uh, rebuking him, said to him, <laughs> Jesus just recognized what was going on here right away. He says, uh, uh, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Notice what Jesus did. He turned his back. He looked to the crowd. And says, get behind me, Satan. Because you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Many of those things that we have, our motive, many of those resolutions that we would make, is made because of the things of men. When we make our New Year's resolution, we, put our, we look in the mirror and we say, oh no, this weight has to go. Or where we say, you know what, I have to work out to fit in this dress for the next prom or whatever the case might be. All of this is me motivated, self motivated. It's all because of me. Peter confessed that, he, that Jesus is the Messiah because of his personal interests. He wanted a Messiah that would give him a position in the, in the kingdom. And so it is that we have a representative in Peter in this account because he's standing there saying that, hey, I need my Messiah to be alive. Don't talk about suffering. Don't talk about being killed because I will be losing out on a prized possession. That's why your New Year's resolution will fail. Because at the end of the day, you sat down and you, you went on Facebook and you searched for the guy that you like to marry. Hello, somebody. Or you search for the girl and he says, all right, I'm working out for this one. I'm going to get that protein, right, Rondi? <laughs> I'm going to beat that protein shake <laughs> and I'm going to lift that weight. You see, but, 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 but you see, it's self motivated self-interest you go and you buy that jogging shoes and you bought you go and you go buy those yoga pants and you get in your yoga pants and you just look for Andrews and you just wait until the seminary is out and you just strut right across you know when classes are out self Motivated. Self-interest. That's why you made that New Year's resolution. Am I talking to somebody? Maybe not about the yoga pants. Maybe not. Right? Maybe I'm not, about, not about the pants. But I'm talking to somebody, right? Okay. That's Peter. That's our representative in this account. But this is what happened. Jesus pulled the, gr the crowds together. And he said... He's, the Bible says, verse 34, let's keep going. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them these three things. Whoever desires to come after me. This is a very bold step for Jesus to be asking people to come after him at this moment. You don't call people to come after you when there's a reigning empire, a reigning Roman empire. And Jesus boldly, boldly said to these folks, whoever is going to come after me, whoever desire to come after me, let him deny himself. That's one of your three things. Deny yourself. Now, what does this denying mean? Oh, we Adventists, we know how to do this denying. We, we, we specialize in de denying. 
But I want to tell you, I just want to just muddy your water a little bit. This denying is not talking about you trying to get rid of your cheese for the New Year's. This denying is not talking about trying to cut the salt for the New Year's. This denying is not, is not, is not talking about uh, 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 getting rid of that thing you have in the fridge, the legs and wings. This denying is not talking about any form of ascetic living where you, you pack your things up and you, you leave and you go live in the woods in Tennessee off the grid. I might need to cut that out. This denying is not talking about robbing yourself of pleasure. Neither it is, it, is it denying or is it saying you should hate yourself. No. But what is it then? Since it's not all that, this is what it is. This denying of self is denying something to the self. Let me say that again. It is not the denying of something to the self, but it is denying the self itself. Did you get it? It is not denying the chocolate to the self, but it is denying the self that wants the chocolate. It is not denying something to the self, but denying the self itself. One of American greatest, or one of American brightest, Lindsay Lohan, in 2011, she got into trouble because she went into the store, and she is an actress, by the way, but this is what an actress did. She did this. She went into the store, and she stole some necklace. Now, this, the necklace that Lindsay Lohan stole, it's not the necklace you pick up at Walmart, okay? It was, it was a good price type of necklace. But, but, but Lindsay Lohan was, was tried and she was uh, blaming the media and she was blaming the criminal justice system and she eventually said this. She said this after being sentenced for, this is her sentence by the way. This, listen to this sentence for, for stealing the necklace. I believe that if some, some of us, maybe myself, if I stole the necklace and give it to my wife, uh, uh, you know, my, my sentence wouldn't sound like this. She was sentenced to 12-hour shifts. 12-hour shifts working at a mortuary. Well, that sounds a bit weird. Working with dead bodies, 12-hour shifts for four months. After a few weeks, Lindsay Lohan says, it's not worth it. I've learned. I've learned. And something got to change. And it's me, myself. She said that. After 12, working 12-hour 12 shifts at a mortuary, I believe for me, maybe the first day at work, I'll figure out that. <laughs> Denying ourselves do not take a year to figure out when something is wrong in our lives. But there's another thing. We're in the selfie age. Come on, put your hands up if you took your selfie this morning before you come to church. All right, never mind. <laughs> You're not going to do that. <laughs> but we are in what is called a selfie age. A selfie age. What is a selfie age? Apps are created based on selfies. Yeah. So for those of us who don't know what a, a selfie is, um, Enoch, can, do you know what a selfie is? I think you do. You, took, you, you take for selfies. You see, he knows. Selfie is you taking a picture of yourself. Right? I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. But the thing is, what this selfie age is doing for us is pointing our eyes to us. You could do this. You have done this. And you will be able to do this. And so what happened is that self tapped me on my shoulder this week. And when I was there struggling and reading through this, self tapped me on the shoulder and says, but Dwight, you haven't been so bad after all this year. And I said, what? What does that, what is that? 
You haven't been so bad. After all, you're still married. After all, you, you, you know, you, 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 know you, you didn't cheat in your exams. You didn't get kicked out of the seminary. You're, you're doing pretty good. But I looked self on the other side. And I said, were it not for grace, if it wasn't for Jesus, where would I have been? Self came and tried to get me to buy into the selfie stuff. But I remind self that I am nothing without Jesus. He should be the center. He should be the object of my worship. He should be the object of my, li my living. Jesus should be the object of what I do day in, day out. My resolutions will not work. They will fail unless I consider these three things. Deny self. So I'm going to ask you, I, saw, I found this little quote. It says here, scientists prove that people who take six or more selfies in a day and upload them to the internet, they have serious mental disease. Now, you could do further research on that, but it's kind of crazy because you take 59, you take 50 pictures and you delete all 50 of them and then take another one and then you delete that one. So my, my thing to you, uh, 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 young folks, I know you, the young folks, y'all look good and everything. You look good, you look right, and, and God got you, all right? Your, your, your Facebook, you have your Facebook game, it's actually going, that's good. But guess what? Uh, get over this selfie stuff for a little bit. Maybe, this, maybe you would want to try this one here. The thing is that I'm trying to point you somewhere, I'm trying to point you somewhere else where you don't have to do all this work. Because you see, if you put up, uh, people go on your selfies and they make comments and they grade you. Okay? There's nothing like being graded by Jesus. Because guess what? You will always have a pass mark. Because you are not living, but it is Jesus that is living in you. So when you, when you take a selfie and upload it to Jesus' internet, Jesus said, this is all right. I could work with this because I died for this. I died for you. And so the selfie that you put on Facebook and have people uh, 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 running after you and trying to tell you all sorts of stuff, and then you get crazy, and sometimes it drives a lot of young people to committing suicide. Hear me out. You will not commit suicide because Jesus paid too high a price for your life. Jesus should be the object of your selfie. Amen. If you make New Year's resolution this year, you will fail if you don't consider these three things. One, deny self. And two, take up your cross. Take up your cross. I know I'm running out of time, but it's all right. It's cold outside. You're not going anywhere, so might as well you just stay here with us. Um, take up your cross. So, selfie, by the way, let me leave you with this point here before we move on to take up your cross. To renounce self is to have Jesus as the dominant element in our lives. It is to replace self with God in Christ as the object of our affections. It is to place the divine will of God before my personal will. To deny oneself is this. It's simple this. To accept God's point of view about you. No longer should you go into Facebook looking for the comments to see what people think of you, but you should accept God's point of view about you. Still addressing Peter, Jesus says you should, and the crowd, Jesus says that you should deny self and take up cross. Deny self and take up cross. Deny self and take up cross. Take up cross. What do I know about taking up cross? Uh, uh, what is taking up cross? Is, is, is it the understanding that taking up my cross is living with a spouse that beats me? Oh, it's just my cross. I just got to bear my cross. Is it, is it that uh, bearing my cross is living with an illness because 
you find yourself in an unfortunate situation. Is that what we understand of bearing a cross? I hope not what Jesus was telling this population at this time. You see, when Jesus was speaking to this, these people, he was actually talking to them when, when we all know that the Romans were, were, were on top of things. They had many countries under their control. This, con this, 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 this cross idea was a Roman thing. And so when Jesus said, you have to deny self, and then the next thing was take up cross, they're like, a cross? Is this the guy that we just claim to be the Messiah? Now he's talking about a cross. You see, the cross meant at the time that, that, that there's only one authority that can actually condemn you to the cross. Hear me out for a little bit here. So, 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 so the cross represent shame, right? The cross represent unworthiness. The cross represent the worst of the worst. And so the Romans used the cross to crucify those criminals that they would like to remind that I am, am in control. I am in control. This is what the Romans says now. So, 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 so Enoch, so when, 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 a, when a criminal commits a crime and he gets the cross, the Roman Empire is sending a message to him, even though he's going to his death, and to those who are looking and saying, hey, this is what I will do to you if you keep messing up. That was the understanding that that first century uh, 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 population have of the cross. But Jesus says this, deny self, take up your cross and follow me. You see, what Jesus is about to do right here is this. Jesus used the cross knowing his population. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. What Jesus is about to do is about to change the definition of the cross. Oh, I only hear one. You, you probably don't get where I'm going with this. So let me come back here. So, 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 so Jesus told, is saying to his, his population here, his crowd here, take up your cross and follow me. What Jesus is trying to say is that what I'm about to do, I'm still unpacking this suffering thing. I'm about to take up my cross. And when I carry my cross over here to Mount Calvary, by the time I am done with Mount Calvary, the cross belongs to me. And so what Jesus did, he's saying that, hey, hey, if, 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 if you know that, that the earthly cross or this cross belongs to the Roman authority, if you follow me, the cross that you will bear has my authority. It's all right. You could just go and uh, let it simmer later when you get home. Uh, uh, but, but what Jesus is doing here for his people is to, to let them know that you no longer live by this cross. Yes, this cross will bring you to your earthly death. Yes, this cross will bring shame to you. But I am telling you something. I today will change, or when I go through my suffering, will change the meaning of this cross. Take up your cross and follow me. I must tell you this. For you to bear a cross at that time, even though you are a guilty criminal, you would kind of say, no, I can't do this. But we're fighting about that same battle today. It says this here, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that one can ever fought. The reason why you have yet, as a church member, as a member of this church, the reason why you haven't taken up your cross or even throughout this year, God, God, grace brought you this far, but you probably left your beam, your cross beam back in January. You started the year and you were supposed to bear a cross, but you left the beam all the way back in March. But you find yourself here because of grace. Self, 
self have you put that cross down. But now that you are here, I'm kind of giving you one more challenge. And that challenge is take up your cross and follow him. Following him is very easy. Following Jesus is very easy. I'm closing here. Following Jesus is very easy. What happened is with the two denying self, it's automatic to take up your cross. Because when you deny self, it's no longer you that lives, it's Jesus that lives. You would have responded to Matthew 11, uh, verse 20, 28. You would have come because you are weary and you are heavy laden and you are entered now into rest. And so your cross is not as heavy as Jesus' cross. Your cross is light because Jesus' burden is light. Your cross is just to make that decision to follow Jesus. Follow him right into death. That's, a resol that's something that's better than a resolution. To deny self, to take up cross and follow him. I would like to follow Jesus. Is there anyone here like to follow Jesus? Amen. Amen. This is what Auntie Ellen says. She says this. Come on, read with me, everyone. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections, the knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges. Weaken your confidence in your own sincerity and cause you to feel that God cannot accept you. Your resolutions, your New Year's resolutions are like ropes of sand. You is created to fail you. You failed you. It's your resolutions. But if we give Jesus a chance... But she says this, be not despair. Do not be despair. Because you can do nothing by yourself. Because we have a Jesus who is, an, is our advocate with the Father. And he's there ready to lift our heavy burdens. I would like to challenge you this, this afternoon to give Jesus a second chance. I would like for you to do these three things instead of taking on another list of New Year's resolution. I'd like for you to do these things, my friend. Take up cross. I mean, deny self. Take up cross and follow him. Is that all right? Can we do that? Yeah. All nations, can we do that? Yeah. Can we deny self, take up cross, and follow him this year? I think we can. We can, not because of me, and not because of myself, but because of Jesus. Because of the King of Kings. Because of the Lord of Lords. Why don't you stand with me this morning, this afternoon? Dear Lord, this morning, this afternoon, God, we just want to we want to thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us an example in Peter and the other guys and all the, the crowd that was around you that time. God, we thank you that you look way down in time and you saw that we were going to be struggling with our own self. And you gave us these three things. You said if we just deny who our self is, if we just deny our own personal interests, if we just deny our, own, our plans and just look at your point of view and follow you, take up our cross and follow you, everything will be all right. You made me, you made all of us who we are, where we find ourselves, and the world cannot. The world cannot tell us who we really are. Only you, God. And so, Lord, as we commit ourselves to you this day, and as we pledge, as we come to you in prayer, and as we, as we start this upcoming year, God, we are hopeful that you will help us. We can't deny self even by ourselves, but you will help us 
to deny self. You will help us to take up cross. As a matter of fact, you will carry the cross for us. And God, there is nothing like following you. Nothing come, can compare to following you. And Father, wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you go, I will follow. And that's, that's what we want. What, that's what we're praying today, Jesus. Wherever you go, we will follow. It's not about who we follow on Twitter. It's about following you because you had this concept of following way before we even thought about Twitter. And so, God, I'm following you. Hashtag to the cross. That's where I'm following you. In Christ's name, amen.